Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. Ed, I'm John Zimmerman, and this is season four finale. It's a live streaming, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Mayor John Botters from the city of Emeryville, California. Mayor John, welcome. Thanks, John. How you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be a lot of fun. It is uh, season four. Four is my lucky number, so I'm happy to be the the Christmas present under the tree at the end of the season here. Oh, very good, very good, cool. Well, we've got folks uh, tuning in from all over the world. I already see some folks, uh, you know, chiming in from the Netherlands uh, and a few from uh, Northern California, which is where you're at. Uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you just take a, a moment to introduce introduce yourself to the audience? Well, I'm John Bowders. I'm a council member and the current mayor of the city of Emeryville in Northern California, which is on the east side of the bay. And I uh, have been elected in office since 2016. I serve in a number of other capacities uh, on behalf of my city, including the chair of the Alameda County Transportation Commission and the chair of the Bay Area's Air Quality Management District Board. I'm a very fervent supporter of going outside in all of its ways and most commonly bicycling and hiking and walking. So excited to join you here today to talk about people oriented cities, which is my favorite topic and active towns. Fantastic. That's great. And in fact, uh, we all kind of know about you because you went a little <laughs> viral <laughs> over the last year or so. Why don't you kind of share a little bit of, of that story of, of, you know, really kind of what happened and in particular on Twitter. Sure. The, the irony of all of it to me is that I don't have any other social media. Uh, I never wanted social media. My former employer actually required me to get some form of a social media handle because I had an invitation to meet Michelle Obama back in 2015. And I really wanted to go. And my boss was like, you know, you do all this cool stuff at work, but you never elevate any of the things you're doing. And they've been pushing me to do a social media handle. I've never had Facebook or you know, any of these other things that people use, I guess. And they were like, you have to have at least something so that you can document meeting Michelle Obama. And the comms director was like, Twitter's the easiest. Back then it was 140 characters. Just a couple pictures, a couple tweets will be fine. So I got a Twitter page. I had like 11 followers for the first few years. <laughs> and so to your point, uh, earlier this year, nothing has changed about me or what I do, but uh, I had a tweet about eliminating parking spaces every time someone complains to me about a bike lane or a bicyclist in traffic. Uh, and for whatever reason, that struck a nerve with some folks and people started tuning into what we're doing here in Emeryville and my take on people oriented cities, everything from housing and active transportation to environmental justice, sustainability and um, living wages for people. So, you know, it's it's kind of been a ride since then. I've been invited to all sorts of things all around the world. I'm happy to hear there's some friends from the Netherlands here. Uh, I got a wonderful trip to the Netherlands earlier this year with uh, some great, amazing people there. And uh, yeah, I've just, it, it's, I just use Twitter essentially to share my perspective. I don't really have an agenda per se, other than joy and giving people the opportunity to see what's possible. It's been a fun ride. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of fun ride, you're, you're also, you have the tendency to sort of speak your mind at times. And so in fact, mm -hmm. I love this article here from July where it's like outspoken mayor, John Potters, <laughs> <laughs> which is really, you know, it was kind of fun. I mean, well, yeah, I, actually, you know, he just kind of calls it like it is and, you know, says it, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit and scroll down. Uh, but yeah, so you just sort of trending all over the place, especially on bike Twitter, but you were also being, you know, contacted by various uh, newspapers and rags and podcasts and, and YouTube channels. Uh, was it a little surreal to like suddenly be trending on quote unquote hashtag bike Twitter? Yeah, it is unusual, especially as a person who has very mediocre technology skills and does not view himself as a technology or social media oriented person. Uh, I find it funny that I get stopped all over the place. I mean, I was on my very first trip to Houston early this year and I was bicycling in Houston. I was stopped at a light and a person next to me at the stoplight was like, you're the mayor of Emeryville, California. And I was like, okay, this world is getting way too small for me. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's a little surreal. Uh, I, I had a couple people interview me recently, contact me to ask if I would be a keynote at a conference. I got asked if I would, you know, do an interview on a national, uh, a national journal. And the emails I get, they're like, well, given that you're a national influencer on this, I just don't really see myself that way. Um, clearly, there's some people who think that and I'm, I'm 
very blessed that people feel that way, but I, I've never really thought anything I had to say was extraordinary or unique, but what I'm learning is that there's an, uh, an absence of apparently voices like mine in positions like mine. And so there's a, a desire for more of it. And I think that's, that's the thing I'm taking away from all of it is that there's, there's definitely an appetite for more people who are willing to just talk openly, candidly without any particular agenda or point of view about just what people are into cities and safe streets means for us. Right. And you mentioned uh, Houston, so I pulled up uh, this uh, particular shot from Houston. Uh, I am, of course, am, am based out of Austin, Texas, and uh, both Houston and Austin right now, we're like under freezing. I think it's like 25 degrees right now Fahrenheit, which is really, really cold for us. But uh, you, it was clearly warmer on this day when you were in Houston. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, it was it was actually hot on this day. So the Bay Area is usually kind of naturally air conditioned to like 55 to 65 degrees. So um, I'm spoiled. I grew up in Michigan where it was really cold and I'm used to cold. But uh, the amazing folks at Bike Houston, uh, Joe Kertrufo, like and others, uh, put together a bike ride. I went down to speak at the Bike Houston Summit, uh, joined a panel with a couple other a council member from uh, Houston and um, somebody from their state transportation board and they plan to ride anytime I visit a community, whether I'm speaking or they're on my regular family or business trips, I try to plan a ride with people who want to ride and they put together a fully curated ride to show me all kinds of fun stuff in Houston. And it was pretty hot and the ride was pretty long, but it did end with ice cream and beer. And that is the best way to end a bike ride. So it was a good time. Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding? <laughs> Especially when it's, when it's uh, hot out there. Now you mentioned Michigan. And so, um, I'm going to pull up a, a, a shot here. This is one of my favorite places in North America. Uh, you might be able to predict what, what this might be. Uh, but for those of you who have not yet visited uh, Mackinac Island in, in Michigan, um, what makes Mackinac special? Oh, there's a lot of things that make Mackinac special. I, I mean, I grew up in Michigan, as I already mentioned. And so Mackinac Island was something that as a kid, you just really like to, you'd like to go to Mackinac Island in the summer. It's a pastime for those of us who grew up in the Midwest. Um, it's a car-free island. Uh, and with the exception of Mike Pence uh, kind of busting the bubble back in 2016 or 17 and bringing an SUV onto the island, which is just ridiculous, uh, this has been a car-free place. There are tons and tons of uh, cycling opportunities, walking, scooters, horse-drawn carriages. Um, but Mackinac Island and, and the town there are car-free and have essentially largely been their entire existence. And it's a great place to go get fudge and uh, see some great art and spend some time in the beautiful waters of Lake Huron. So I finished my annual hike at Mackinac. I, crossed, I did the Upper Peninsula of Michigan this year, and I finished at Mackinac and spent a few days there and had a great time. You just glossed right over that. I mean, <laughs> that was an <laughs> epic hike. You you did the yeah. UP and mm -hmm. uh and and you you sort of touched base uh, out on twitter uh or at least you tried to every day and you sent out you know because you didn't always have uh, cell phone coverage but you would try to mm -hmm. send out at least a pin to let us know where you were and it was it was a hoot to follow and and of course the grand finality finale of actually you know showing up on Mackinac, which i will emphasize once again it is a car free island it's a car free space right here in north america it has always been car free uh, but yeah please uh, share a little bit about that that epic journey that you were on sure so i i really prioritize um going outside as a path towards physical and mental wellness and there are you know you don't have to hike 400 miles like i do every summer uh to do that you can do 20 minutes of outdoor time a day it's been shown to um, dramatically increase uh, people's resting heart rates, um, serenity, calmness, peace of mind, uh, provides clarity and thinking. Just spending 20 minutes in nature or outside in a park sitting on a bench is a really amazing benefit for your body and your well-being. And I work in a space in my full-time job. I do trauma services and advocacy for victims of violent crime. Uh, I deal with a lot of secondary trauma from um, the stories and the experiences of the people who I work um, in support of. And so I take, I have a really amazing employer who gives me this amazing benefit every year to use my health leave uh, collectively in the month of August. And I go for a hike. Last last year, I hiked 
of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, the year before, I hiked from the Canadian border at Minnesota to uh, the Wisconsin to Wisconsin on the Superior Trail. This year, it was the North Country Trail. Um, this coming summer, I will begin at the south end of the Mackinac Bridge at the top of the Lower Peninsula, and I will hike to Manistee National Forest or State Park in um, the Lower Peninsula. And every year, I do about 400 miles of solo backcountry hiking. Uh, I just it's me in the wilderness for about a month, and I really enjoy it. And I come back totally refreshed to put in more bike lanes. I love it. I love it. And and you know, and that's not a, a you know. It, 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 I guess it, it's really important to, to say that, you know, you, you just kind of said that nonchalantly and then I come back refreshed and be able to put in some more bike lanes. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, we mentioned it earlier. You were really, you sort of busted into the scenes in terms of bike Twitter and we took notice. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. One of the things that we love so much about what that has done for us is, you know, whether you wanted it or not, <laughs> you know, you just started communicating and, 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 and I remember that tweet that you put out there about the, the parking and, you know, that's what was refreshing about it is to actually see somebody in city leadership, uh, you know, state bluntly the facts and, and, and the fact that we really, you know, do need to be rethinking how our public spaces, our streets are our largest public spaces within uh, our cities. And we need to be rethinking about, you know, how that space is used and make it more, um, more safe, inviting and appealing to all ages and abilities. So yeah, you get refreshed, you get back on the ground and you, and you you talk about this very, very publicly about this is the agenda, and it seems like you've got at least some of your city council, <laughs> other members of your city council that are also on board. So talk a little bit about Emeryville. What's special about Emeryville, and what about the challenges of trying to transform car-centric designs of California in the Bay Area of California uh, to a more people-oriented place? Sure. Well, I, I serve with the most amazing city council um, for the past six years. The, the members of the city council that I've served with have just been super supportive of every initiative we've undertaken related to livability and people oriented infrastructure. It's not limited. I mean, people think of us now as this place trying to reinvent streets for safe purposes and bikes. And that's true. But we're also like a regional and state leader on affordable housing production. We have the highest minimum wage in the nation. We have a fair work week policy that um, provides predictive scheduling and paid family sick leave to anybody who's an hourly employee in the city. We um, are one of only a handful of cities in California that has city run childcare for families and employees who come to work in our, in our town. We have a free transit system. So all the property owners pay into a parcel based improvement district and we run a free transit system for people so they don't have to use the car here. We, we have been innovating and leading um, in all these spaces, you know, at, for one time. And it's a lot, a lot of uh, folks go, oh, it's a small city. It's not replicable. But whereas you see on this map, we're like the heart of an urban core. Um, we have as many high rises as most of the bigger cities around us. We're, we're uh, really trying to build dense, sustainable, livable um, community here. We're right across the bay there, as you can see from San Francisco. And so these are these are issues that we've been um you know dealing with for a long time especially uh smart smart development on streets and street safety and i don't think it's it's radical uh, and i think that we need to stop letting people you know co-opt the term radical and say this radical bike agenda i'm wearing my you know i'm wearing my <laughs> bike my my <laughs> radical bike lobby like you know here i'm the bike mafia to a lot of people but the truth of the matter is i never campaigned on bikes I never campaigned on bikes. I never campaigned on bike um, infrastructure. A lot of people say, I don't remember you campaigning. This. I was like, because I didn't. I campaigned on making our cities safer, more livable, um, healthier for everybody. And when you look at what things deliver on that, like safety, like why can't every parent and go to work and come home alive? Why can't children choose to go independently to school on a safe, protected bike route? Why shouldn't uh, senior citizens be able to access transit and live independently into you know in their homes deep into life like why why are these hard things they shouldn't be that's nothing radical about that and so i think the thing that we've done is 
we've just not allowed that type of counter narrative to stick. We just speak really authentically and proactively about why the things we do are actually safety, their health, their community building, their independence, you know, uh, sustaining. They're, they're just all the things that everybody likes to talk about, but nobody wants to commit the time to. And so committing the time to making streets safe and people oriented is actually one of the one of the most fun things that I get to do um, as a council member. And I see it build community. I see it improve lives. And, you know, like when people don't want to reelect me to be on the city council or when I decide it's time to go do something else, um, there'll be a different voice at the table at that point. But while I'm here, this is what I'm committed to doing. And I don't remotely. Yeah, there's people who antagonize about it and argue about it. I get emails every few weeks about stuff. Um, we just put in brand new bike lanes around all of our schools. We removed the street parking. We put a diverter in next to one school. I got emails about you took away the parking and this isn't implemented correctly. And and I just write them, hey, thanks for emailing about our project to make kids routes to school safe. I'm so glad you agree with me that kids should be able to go to and from school safely. Here's why a city approved engineer designed it this way. And here's why we're keeping it. And And I'm just really friendly about it. And I don't like there's no FUs and throwback and ignoring people. I just engage people head on. And I'm like, this is why we did it. And nine out of 10 people don't respond to me after I tell them why we did it for safety. Cause what is the argument? You don't want kids to be safe. You don't want mom and dads to come home from work alive, like get over yourself. So yeah. um, that's just my style. And it, it, you know, it doesn't sit well with everybody, but it's, it's who, who the people here elected and how I'm going to lead. Yeah. Yeah. And I lingered on this map simply because I, I did want to to point out that uh, yeah, you're the the city itself uh, is uh, butted right next to to Oakland. We had uh, Warren Logan on the podcast not too long ago, uh, talking about uh, Oakland, and he gave you a nice shout out during that uh, episode as mm -hmm. well, uh, because you know as we talked about in that episode is that you know the, there's no like real dividing line i mean there's a blending of of the different uh, uh, municipalities in that area and so you could very easily be on a bike and going you know from oakland into uh, emeryville and then back into oakland or somewhere else so uh it's it is kind of all together and uh, it, it is wonderful to to kind of put Emeryville on the map a little bit, you know, cause you know, many people don't know where Emeryville is, but they do now. No. <laughs> now yeah. It's, it's funny. People, people, people think it's like a huge city people. Yeah. I, it's funny. You get like a following on Twitter and I, I, I have people who are like, Oh, I think Emeryville has a hundred thousand people in it. And I'm just like, <laughs> not yet. I'm like, not quite yet. We're, we're yeah, working yeah, on yeah. that, but not a hundred thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I do want to put up a, a comment here, and folks, if you do have any questions or comments, of it, you know, please, uh, I am trying to monitor the uh, the chat, the live chat that's going on. But uh, uh, JC had a, something very nice to say. He says, uh, uh, Mayor Botters is a hero of mine. He's the equivalent of Anne Hidalgo. Bravo. Our local officials give lip service to active transport and air quality action, uh, but then do little. Uh, and so... You know, hey, I, I think it's it, it's worthy, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. That it's actions speak louder than just words. We need to actually do things. Yeah, and that's I, I always you know sometimes I get pushback from other electeds on some of the regional boards I'm on or questions you know about well you know I don't know about this or that. I'm like, well, wait a second, we just spent a whole year developing a plan. Is the goal of the plan to put it on a shelf to collect dust for 10 years so that some other group of people in these seats can then go, oh, it's time to redo the plan that we'll never use. So right. I'm not I'm not that guy. I, like if yeah. the plan says there's going to be protected bike infrastructure, then great. Yeah. That's where the money is going to go. So we put safety and bikes at the top of our county transportation plan. And I was elected chair of the board this year. And we went out to put out a call for about one hundred and fifty million dollars of discretionary funds for projects. And before we put out the call, we had a commission meeting and I, I said, I'd like to change the way the scoring for applications and projects is, is considered. I want to add points for safety. So if the project addresses our high injury network is going to alleviate or remediate a pedestrian crossing place where we have lots of injuries or deaths or a bike area where there's lots of injuries or deaths. Um, I want that to get points if it fulfills part of the countywide bike plans network. I want should get extra points. The idea being that like we can just you know talk about safety and and pretend that that's a, a great thing and put it in a plan and say oh we checked a box. But if you're not going to implement it, 
and actually act upon what you're doing. Like my goal is to get to a real vision zero is to actually have the county not have pedestrian and bike dust. If you're going to do that, you have to build the things that make that possible. And when you prioritize money, you have to put your money where your plan says it belongs. And so to me, it's very logically lined up. But politics often interfere with it and people don't want to do the protected lane because this business owner might be upset about it or don't want to prioritize this neighborhood because um, I, you know, I, I need to politically address this other neighborhood's concern first and dump resources in an already sometimes over-resourced area. So it, it, it takes a lot of times I find being the person, I often find that I have to be a voice of, well, we're going to keep doing it this way for this reason. Um, and I don't think I'm alone. I think there's other people who like join very quickly to what I'm saying and say, yeah, let's, let's do this. And once you start achieving the results, as I learned in my city, people want more of it. They're like, wow, this actually improved our community. This made uh, it better. My kids go to the playground on their own. Now they do this and that. And once you get that ball rolling and you actually show people the outcomes don't have the sky falling, like a lot of people will come tell you, it becomes easier to do it. It's those first few times when there's all the opposition. And once you break through it, the narratives they have don't stick after that. And you have to just have people who are not afraid of of getting things done and not afraid of the political backlash, the bike lash to doing things. And that's how you make progress. Yeah. And JC also, uh, you know, pointed out not letting the fa- false counter narrative uh, stick or dominate. Yes. Good leadership. And, and I think that's part of what's so refreshing about what you have brought, uh, you know, to this space and in it, and it's, you know, quite refreshing and, uh, and, <laughs> quite frankly i mean it's it's like we're so excited to see this and you're not alone there are some good uh mayors and other uh, leaders you know across north america that are starting to step up and starting to have that same sort of approach and and sense of leadership that uh, uh, mayor hildalgo which was uh, jc had mentioned earlier is moving forward with uh, with a sense, sense of urgency i remember visiting paris in 2015 for her very first car free day uh, and she says, look, we've got a problem. We can't even see the Eiffel Tower through the smog. We need to do something different. And so it, it's it's really super, super exciting and refreshing to see. I want to pull up this because you were part of a delegation, as you had mentioned, that went to the Netherlands. And so this is mm-hmm. uh, from the Dutch Cycling Embassy. And you had uh, the ability to go on this trip. And this was a trip that was actually sponsored by the the Dutch embassy that had the real Dutch embassy, not the cycling embassy, although the cycling mm-hmm. embassy certainly participated and helped uh, with this. And it was what was so cool about this, too, is this list of folks that you were there with. Uh, your name is first on the list here. And then second on the list is uh, one of our council members right here in Austin, uh, Texas, uh, Vanessa Fuentes. Talk a little bit about this experience and this cohort of peers that you will forever be <laughs> connected with. Yeah, I, this was a this was really a privilege of a lifetime. I this kind of in my case originated uh, about a year ago when I I had you know made a little bit of a splash, I suppose, on Twitter and um, the Dutch embassy here in San Francisco reached out and they asked if they could have a meeting with me, and I thought like. <laughs> Why? <laughs> like, why do you want to talk to the mayor of Emeryville? But I, I said, sure. Were I said, yeah. Like, and he's what like, did we I do come? wrong? <laughs> I, I was just like, I, I, I was like, I don't, did I, did I, did I win the lottery or something? So um, I, I was like, sure, of course. And they asked if they could come. They said, we want to learn about what you're doing in your town. We've heard a lot about your bike stuff. And so I actually took the, uh, the consul general and staff on a bike tour of my city. And I showed them all the projects in the works. And I said, here's what we're doing, why we're doing it. Here's these things to come. Let them see kind of how it's integrating with housing and other other um, services we have. And I've just retained a relationship with Dirk and Jan and everybody. And they, they're they fantastic. They're lovely people. And uh, they reached out to me. I'm, I'm looking to actually bring the Dutch Cycling Embassy to my county um, this coming year to do a master class for all the city engineers in the cities in my county to help give them skills about how they could improve bike infrastructure countywide, right? Because to your point, the border between an Emeryville and an Oakland or any other city in my county for that matter, doesn't really matter if, if, the, if the, the, um, the infrastructure is not continuous in its safety and, it, and its delivery, it's not gonna be used well. So I'm trying to like build that framework. And so we've had that conversation and then they reached out to me in May and said, well, 
we think that the Dutch government, the, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, is going to actually do an urban mobility study tour for somewhere between five and 10 officials, some elected, some transportation directors in the Netherlands. Would you like to go? We get to nominate somebody. And I was like completely flattered that they thought of me. And I, of course, was like, yes. So uh, I, I got to go to the Netherlands uh, and with this amazing group of people you see here, uh, all of them were quite a bit of fun. We we had a daily tour of a different city, Nijmegen. We went to um, Rotterdam at one day. We were in Utrecht. We, we, we got to go and kind of see different elements of design uh, because each of the cities we were coming from, each part of the country had different needs and different you know, uh, layouts and infrastructure stuff. So it was interesting to learn, cross learn from everybody. Uh, I had a blast, uh, you know, Everett Lott from um, DC dot, I just, D dot, I just had a great time with him as well. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to some of the things that Washington DC is hopefully going to do under his leadership in the coming year. But I, it was a lot of fun. It was a second to none. Um, and as you probably know, I built on a family history bike tour to the end of that trip. Um, but I really came back uh, with a lot of tools and uh, I'm really looking forward to having some of these design folks who partner with the Dutch government come into my city and help uh, make my community more bike friendly. And that would be, um, that bike is named Jockey and uh, it was actually loaned to me for five days by a follower on Twitter I had never met who heard that I wanted to bike. Um, I'm Belgian uh, by ethnic origin. And my great uh, grandmother, uh, both my great grandparents, but she emigrated here um, at the end of World War One after her village was destroyed by the Germans. And uh, she never spoke English. She was a widow at 35 with three children and she washed clothes in other people's homes to provide for her family. And I had never had the chance to visit the town she was from and I wanted to do it. I wanted to take a bike trip across the Netherlands and then down through Belgium and end in Brussels. And I was looking for a bike and a amazing uh, Twitter follower uh, offered me his bike and I biked across the Netherlands and Belgium for three days and had an amazing time. Yeah. And there you go. And there, yeah, it was really weird to visit. Uh, the, that's a village just outside the village that um, that's in Ilko and that's just outside uh, Zomerheim where my great grandmother is from. And it was super weird to see my family name on buildings and on storefronts because it's the area that my family's uh, origin is from. I had never seen that in my life. Yeah, 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 and I had my uh, the opportunity to to visit Belgium for the very first time uh, a few weeks ago. I was able to jump on the train and and go from uh, Rotterdam over to uh, uh, to to Brussels to meet with uh, Jill Warren, the uh, CEO of the um, European Cyclist Federation, and so it was wonderful to to get a little bit of a taste of of the 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 Belgium environment and get a little bit of sense of, of Brussels and and I know that they are working hard to uh, try to improve the cycling infrastructure there and and traffic calm some of their streets as well because uh, it just like many other cities around the globe uh, they started converting their streets their downtown historic streets into uh, auto only zones or auto prioritized zones and so there's a lot of these places that we just sort of assume are Shangri-La and wonderful for, for cycling. Not, not so they're, mm -hmm. they're having to do the hard work, which I think is one of the main things that you ended up learning about during that study tour and probably in preparation for it is the history of the fact that, uh, the Netherlands had to do a heck of a lot of work to become more bicycle friendly. Yeah, I, I would, I would gather that most of the people who follow your podcast and, and what you, um, you talk about already know, some of that history, uh, you know, it's interesting when you think of a city like Emeryville along the bay, it's very flat. Uh, it's very easy. There's, you know, very easy um, from a geographic perspective to make types of changes that are favorable to cycling. But the advent of the e-bike has also diminished the t those types of narratives like, oh, this town is too hilly or this or that. Like there's a lot of new uh, technology re related to the cycling that gives people more equitable access in other types of communities that aren't flat. But a lot of people said, well, this isn't the Netherlands, you know, this isn't Paris. Uh, and I think one of the greatest juxtapositions I saw was actually in Belgium. I, I got to um, spend a day in Ghent. And while I was there, the vice mayor of Ghent, who's the transportation minister, took me around the whole downtown, like they've, you know, got their whole circulation plan. And it was just amazing. The the, the city of Ghent, uh, I would go back in a heartbeat. It's the, one of the most amazing places I've ever visited. 
And to just see how that community embraced it, there's they, they've adapted, I would say. There's people who definitely don't like having to drive all the way around the city center and not go through it. But the livability of the downtown area and the vibrancy of it is amazing. And to contrast that with Brussels, where there's a lot of very strong resistance to removing the cars from the city center. And there's cars on the sidewalks. They're parked in the tree lawns. The cars are everywhere. And, and, and Brussels was developed in the 1950s and 60s. It was sold as an automobile community. And it's had an addiction to automobiles for a long time. And they, they're really trying to change it. But it is really hard. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and Ghent is going to be the host city for uh, the Velo City Conference in 2024. So um, hopefully, and, and, and Jill Warren uh, wanted uh, me to, to emphasize that uh, next year is going to be uh, in Germany and, uh, and, and hopefully uh, Leipzig is going to be the host city. But in 2024, Ghent's going to be there. And you're absolutely right. That traffic pattern of Ghent is is one of the, the key features. And it's it's not like that that's new. I mean, Groningen did that back in the 1970s into the 1980s. And really, and they're still perfecting that. And many other cities have done it. And uh, in fact, you got to visit uh, along with, uh, I believe, uh, Chris Bruntlett, my good friend Chris Bruntlett, uh, you get to you know spend some time in Utrecht and also um, Houghton. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, Houghton is Houghton is is like if I could just build a city from scratch, I would do it very similar to how Houghton is. Well, a lot more high rises probably, but I uh, it was just amazing to be in Utrecht and and Houghton and just overwhelmed by the culture difference, uh, right? There's infrastructure. The well, what the Dutch are oh, doing sorry is, about that. I have a question for you, which is. I actually have your That's clip okay. here. So I'm going to, I'm going to pop on. Oh, over let's just play. This. Let's go to the clip. Go to the clip. Let, let's go to the clip and let's turn the volume hey up. There. Today I am cycling through Utrecht and Hatta, and I'm with uh, Chris Bruntlett from the Dutch cycling embassy. And Chris, I have a question for you, which is, Americans often say, well, what the Dutch are doing is a Dutch thing. It's not replicable in the United States. What do you say to that? Yeah, I think it's easy to dismiss the Netherlands as irrelevant, a different culture, different weather, different terrain, different built environment. But the fact of the matter is the Netherlands was built around the car like virtually any other country and has subsequently retrofit that environment with great cycling infrastructure. Most of the cycle paths we've been riding on today have built, been built in the last 10 to 20 years. So it's a recent development, but a transformational one that gets everybody uh, out using their public realm and uh, on their bicycles. And uh, I think we can all be inspired by that. I, sh I certainly am. So uh, provided I don't find real estate here in Hauta to stay here and enjoy this lovely <laughs> pro cycling environment 24 uh, seven, I'll be coming back with some new ideas. So until then go outside, see ya. Yeah, it's uh, I, I first visited Houghton in uh, I think 2018, and then I went back this year uh, during my my trip, and I I, I rode from uh, from uh, Utrecht over there to it because it's a it's essentially a suburb a suburban community. Uh, they have wonderful transit, as you well know. But uh, yeah, the way that that city was designed, that new town was designed, was such that uh, um, you know the automobiles uh, in many of the residents, most of the residents actually do own vehicles they may not use them on a daily basis but uh they're able to uh reach their their residence from the perimeter and there's a ring around there but no motor vehicles are, are pretty much uh, allowed through the center and so it's it's a really a, an amazing uh place to visit because it's a relatively new community uh, you know, sort of built around the model of uh, de-emphasizing the motor vehicle. Just, it's it's quite magical, actually. It's it's the way smart, active, people-oriented cities should be done, 100%. Yeah, yeah. So I, we did have a, a couple of questions that I wanted to, to get to. Um, uh, JC had okay. another one here, uh, just kind of asking a little bit about the current Twitter uh, chaos that's going on and uh, if, asking if you're going to stay on Twitter or and kind of get a, a sense as to that. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, I famously <laughs> canceled a meeting with Elon Musk's staff uh, at Tesla, which is here in the Bay Area and under the regulation of a board I chair. Uh, mostly because I don't believe in giving my time to people who are 
um, wasting other people's time and just dis disseminating disinformation. So uh, I, like I said at the outset, I don't have another social media platform. I'm not actually very technologically um, skilled and I don't envision that I will start a new platform. I've had lots of people ask me to go to Post or Mastodon or all these other places and I have not done any of those. Um, I'm going to stay with Twitter for the time being, but I actually think that when, whether it dies kind of a early death because of, um, him or whether it slowly fades off of the radar at some point, I think it's probably the end of my social media existence. Yeah. I just feel like, um, I feel like social media has offered benefits, but it transfer translated. It was one social networking, which I really yeah. support, but it became media. And although I think folks like you are an example of what is really good about social media, I think a lot of people use it to disinform people. And I'm just kind of tired of being in that space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there is that double-edged sword of, of what it is. I mean, on the, the positive side, you're absolutely right. It's one way to really uh, be able to have like this very, very big public square where you're able to, to bring messages out and, uh, and amplify things. And, and quite frankly, you know, meet people like you. <laughs> so that's, that's huge. Yeah. I, I, and I, I think I, I will remain part of this while I, in the ways that I think are benefiting public, um, sharing information, sharing ideas, building community. Those are the ways in which I, and that's, as I very publicly told Mr. Musk, why I'm not meeting with his staff. Um, you know, that's, I'm not looking to engage in, in with people who are going to try to destroy community. I don't, don't engage those folks. Yeah. Yeah. So, Coming back to North America and, uh, you know, the, the challenge that we have uh, of transferring and transforming our built environment into more people-oriented places, we do have some wonderful organizations that are out there that are uh, making great strides, and NACTO is one of them, the National Association for City Transportation Officials. I believe you had an opportunity to make it to the, uh, the meeting, the annual meeting, is that correct? I did. I was invited to be on a panel about uh, communicating uh, with the public and helping people in government office, uh, people who are staff or planning teams and also advocates. I was on a panel with a couple other amazing people to talk about how we communicate. Uh, I think if I had anything to contribute, I feel like that's the thing people want to hear from me the most is how do you communicate what you do? And so I did uh, go to Boston for NACTO this year and I uh, also led at the end of, uh, there were these, um, uh, I forget the term they used for them, but they're, they're essentially like, instead of, uh, classroom, classroom plenaries, they're like walk plenaries or whatever. And I offered to do a bicycle one at the very end. So I hosted the last, uh, active workshop work. Uh, yeah. Walk shop. So it was, uh, mine was a bike shop and, uh, got 15 people and took them on a bike ride of bike infrastructure in Boston, Cambridge and Somerville and, treated them all to ice cream in uh, Harvard Square. So thank you for joining. That's some of the yeah. group there at the end of our bike ride. We had a good time. Yeah. And thank you for doing that, by the way. I unfortunately was not able to uh, make it to uh, NACTO this year because we were hosting the Queen. <laughs> the Queen Maxima <laughs> from the Netherlands was here in Austin, and I was not going to miss that. <laughs> so Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so we did have a question here. Uh, C um, okay. um, is is asking about uh, can, any recommendations on uh, gay, bike friendly, affordable cities. Affordable, I think, is the key here uh, mm. in in the U.S. That you should consider making a new home, having difficulty affording uh, coastal California, which I know <laughs> affordability is also a big challenge that you and your council are are working on. Yeah, we've done a lot on affordability uh, to, to make a dent, build a lot of new affordable housing. We ran a ballot measure in 2018, affordable housing bond, and we're currently, um, we've approved a number of fully affordable projects, which are available to people who make anywhere from 30 to 50 to 80% of the area median income. So very low income and working income households. Um, the question about it being affordable and it also being gay friendly. Mm. That's always a hard one because most of the affordable, I wish, I wish more, I think that there's change afoot. Most of the more affordable communities in the United States are in the middle of the country uh, in places like I'm from in the Midwest. Um, historically, I left those places because they were not 
exactly accommodating and accessible and friendly. But I do think that there, I don't think we should label communities as hostile to the LGBT community forever for how they were. I think that you have to make space to allow people to change and be better. And uh, I feel very optimistic that while you'll never fully change all the hearts and minds of people who have a very particular point of view about what they view the LGBT community to be, I, I do think that there are supportive communities uh, across the the country in places that we might traditionally not think of as being supportive where people can find affordable and bike friendly um, homes. Uh, one of the most amazing places in my opinion is the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. I think they're extremely friendly. I think they're very bike friendly. Um, I think there's more affordable options there than some other places. Um, so I, I, that's one example of a, a larger city I can think of, but there's, there's smaller communities. I think Austin is a really accepting place. I don't know that I, think Austin's got all the bike infrastructure I would want to see in a big city just yet, but I think it's moving in the right direction. So I do think that there are um, more affordable places than California, for sure. Yeah. Well, you know that I have invited you to Austin. And one <laughs> of the reasons why is because, and and, and, and quite frankly, one of the reasons why uh, uh, Queen Maxima uh, did actually uh, visit here is because of the longstanding uh, relationship that the city of Austin has had with the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And it was celebrating the 10 year anniversary of our Think Bike workshop here. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons why I encourage you to come here is because we are in the process about 50% into the, the process of building out a comprehensive all ages and abilities Dutch inspired network. Uh, currently over 200 miles of cycle tracks and cycle paths on the ground uh, heading towards over 400. So we will get you here. <laughs> Oh, you, you don't have to convince me. I also, I just need to call council member Fuentes and tell her I'm coming That's right. and uh, I'll get her. Yeah. I'll get her on a bike ride and we'll go have a community bike ride in Austin. Uh, yeah. Totally not hiding from Austin. I was in Houston this past year. I'm happy to find time to come to Austin and enjoy and partake in all the good work you guys are doing on the bike infrastructure. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And let, let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, getting on a bike and having some fun. So What's going on here? <laughs> so uh, I have been a very big supporter publicly uh, of car-free JFK. So for those who aren't familiar, San Francisco has a beautiful park, um, the, uh, the Golden Gate Park, and in it there's uh, it's it's a very large park. It has several streets through it. One of them is John F. Kennedy. Uh, oh God, you have all the pictures. Uh, John F. Kennedy Drive and. Uh, during COVID, it was closed for um, to cars. It was during COVID. It was an active transportation space for people to safely engage in exercise without being at risk of being in a confined space with other people. And it was just so well loved and used. And it was this amazing opportunity for the city and county of San Francisco to uh, make it permanent. And there was a huge battle that was waged over making it permanent. And the mayor and the city council did the right thing. And they voted to make it permanent and then there was these efforts by some car enthusiasts as i'll say who uh want to put it on the ballot to make it permanently car accessible <laughs> to basically enshrine in law that it had to be a car street for cars only basically and so there were competing measures i and jay i was to get to his car this the car measure jay was the bike and people measure um and so i just leaned in on twitter throughout the year and showed up to some events in san francisco i called into city hall for their meeting um, to just, you know, and it's everybody laughed in the room and it was like, hi, my name is John Bowders and I live in Emeryville. The room started laughing like, cause they all know who I am. And I just yeah. I'm like, your, your car free JFK is amazing. You should do it. So this was bike prom. So um, Sarah Katz Levy, she had, uh, she hosted a bike prom with some amazing friends and supporters of her, Anthony, others who are, um, you know, supportive of th this initiative. And, and she had something called prom on the prom and in the green dress there. And then the last picture is the vice mayor of Emeryville, um, Ali Medina, one of my best friends. And she and I are, we call team transportation. We're the transportation committee in our city. We vote on all the transit projects and she's also a bike enthusiast. She's one of my favorite people in the world. And, uh, I asked her to prom and I, uh, got a cargo, I got a box feet and I, picked her up at city hall. The other council members showed up. We did a boutonniere and corsage exchange. There was formal photos at city hall and I left him Reville city hall, biked her all the way to the ferry in Alameda, actually in Oakland. I'm sorry, the ferry in Oakland. And we took the ferry across and then I biked her up the hill and across San Francisco to prom. 
And uh, while we were on the ferry, everyone thought we were engaged or getting married and people bought us cocktails and we just ran with it. We were like, nobody knows who we are here anyway. And we got to San Francisco. People saw us coming down Market Street and they recognized us. We had our photos taken. And so we got to prom and uh, we were nominated to that last picture you had. We were put on prom court. We were named the bike royalty of, uh, of the event. And so we had a good time. Yeah. It was a fun time. Yeah. And here's another uh, fun photo of uh, of another uh, passenger <laughs> in a box seats. That would be that would be my dog Reina and her and her derpy ears that can't stand up straight. They're so big they hang to the side. It looks like she's dabbing all the time. Um, she, I am in the process of choosing a cargo bike, and we uh, mostly because of her. She has doggles. She loves riding on the bike with me. I have yeah. posted videos of her riding in the front basket, but this was one of her first uh, outings, and we stopped. We were done, and she didn't want to get out. <laughs> she, she was like, we invited her out Why? multiple times. She's like, no, this is this is this is the best thing in the world. So yeah, uh, yeah I'm actually looking to get a recent Mueller Load 70. That's my that's my plan. I think in the next couple of months, that's what I'm looking yeah. at getting. But uh, she she's a big fan of the cargo bike too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. Uh, we actually did have a comment a, a little bit about, uh, the affordability that we were talking about the subject and, mm -hmm. uh, and this particular, uh, neighborhood, the Mueller, uh, neighborhood is here in Austin, Texas. And yes, that is correct. Uh, they were able to build affordable, uh, house intermixed into the neighborhood. You cannot tell which are market rate and which are affordable units and, and houses in there. And there's surprising density in that that particular neighborhood it used to be our airport and so it was one of the, the similar to like what happened in in denver with the uh the old airport being uh, transformed into a, a neighborhood it's the same that happened there at the miller neighborhood and what's also really really unique about the miller neighborhood is uh it was being developed at the time uh, just after the think bike workshop and so the Dutch inspired uh, infrastructure and protected intersections and, and protected and separated uh, cycle paths are all integrated from the ground up from the very beginning uh, in that Miller neighborhood. And so uh, for, for those uh, those people who are moving in, they're not going through a street transformation. The streets were built from the, the get-go and the neighborhoods were built from the very beginning with Dutch cycling infrastructure in place. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a neat neighborhood. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, and and clearly one of the places I'll be taking you up to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a you know there's um there's a couple car free neighborhoods uh, being built um, in the Phoenix area. I think in Tempe in Phoenix area. Yes. There's some there's some other yeah there's some other places I've visited and gone and got to see kind of how the construction is underway. And I just think those that's the way to do all of it. It's just the way. Yeah to build a smart community going forward. I'm looking forward to some of these coming online. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the the neighborhood that you're re referencing in, in Tempe is called the cul-de-sac neighborhood. And yeah. uh, they are actually uh, being quite successful in, in building that out and getting funding. And they have a desire to try to replicate that in multiple uh, locations around North America. So we're looking forward to seeing how that is. And I can't wait to get down there to uh, to profile uh, cul de sac as well. Um, I'll be oh, sure yeah. to include a, a link in the show notes uh, to this uh, live stream uh, so that folks can actually you know take a look at what we're talking about with cul de sac because it's really, really super cool. Now, another fun thing that you did was you got to ride around with Chris. How cool is that? <laughs> I love Chris. Oh, it was awesome. I love Chris Nolte. He's the best. Uh, he he reached out to me, gosh, I guess it was February of this year. And it was because of that initial tweet, I think. And he he was like, hey, yeah, you know, he's profiled and given people tons of expert advice about e-bikes and all the different details on bikes and your choices with bikes. And he's just really a, a down-to-earth guy. He's a total expert on um, on, on bike bike. Uh, just everything bikes in my opinion he just really understands it and he he was like we want to come out and do like a profile and just talk to you and bike with you and i was kind of it was the first one i kind of had and i didn't really know what to think of it i was like i can't believe somebody wants to profile me so i was like sure you can come out from new york and long beach and you know the team came out and uh we picked up bikes and 
we biked all around Emeryville and I basically just geeked out with him and gave him the nerd tour of my town and talked about how we're blowing a hole in this building for a path. And we're going to put the lanes up at the curb level over here and we're going to close the street this way. And, uh, it was a lot of fun he was a lot of fun. And I didn't, that was kind of the, the, I will call it the booster shot to the original tweet because he posted that and hundreds of thousands of people follow it, you know, watched it, who follow him and whatnot. And I just started getting tons of emails from people all over asking to bike with me or tour with me or talk to me. And yeah, Chris really uh, is a really solid person. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's Chris Nolte with Propel Bike. He's also a, a former guest here on the podcast. And I'll, I'll be sure to include that link in the show notes as well. And uh, another fun thing that you got to do is you got to hang out uh, with one of my best friends here in the content creation world, uh, Mr. Clarence Eckerson. And so he's got a film that you, uh, you were part of and you got to hang out in, in New York. So how cool was this? Yeah, this was fun. I actually was in New York. Uh, I was in Boston and New York in back to back sets of days because there's the Boston trip. I was I was out there because uh, our county, we were doing a bond issuance. We have this voter approved sales tax measure, which we use for infrastructure projects. We're ahead of schedule. We're building stuff that we wanted to build. And uh, so we went out and got a AAA credit rating, went to Boston. I met with investors to sell these bonds. And I was in New York to have a day on Wall Street to do a bond issuance on the, on the market. Uh, we had $140 million, something like that, of bonds to sell. We had $680 million in attempted purchases, which tells you how much people want to invest in our county and what we're doing. And I took a took a day at the end of it to um, connect with uh, the transportation advocates there in New York and went on a bike ride. And I, I had a blast. And yeah, uh, Street Films uh, came out and asked if they could you know, join us biking across the Brooklyn Bridge and all the other things I wanted to do. And uh, met a lot of really cool people, had a had a totally good time, and a little video came out of it. And uh, I hope it was uh, a successful a successful promotion for the great advocates in New York who are making all kinds of great changes there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they need to close. They need to close. They need to close Fifth permanently. That's, yes, that's, that's the takeaway. Didn't I see that there's some uh, some uh, advances on that on Fifth? I think I saw that they are they are doing it like I, I think it's like once a week or once a month right now I think it's there, there's some regular schedule for closing it but it is so obvious how much people love it like yeah. why why not figure out just how to make it permanent that's the right. thing yeah yeah any final thoughts that uh, that you have is there something that we haven't yet covered that you want to make sure that uh, you leave the audience with well I I, first, I want to thank you for inviting me to be on the Active Towns podcast. Really appreciate your your work, your advocacy, and your um, voice, and, and helping elevate the voices of other people uh, like myself who are just trying to make our cities safer and more um, habitable for everyone. But I, I guess my my messages to folks are two things: one, go outside. Uh, it's always my message is really go outside um, in whatever fashion or manner that suits you and and with whom you wish and where you wish but go outside uh it's better for you and it's better for all of us uh two my other my other thing is no i'm not going to move to your city and run to be mayor of your city and <laughs> I, get, I get a lot of those Jeez. and uh, i'm not looking to do i'm not looking to do that but what i am going to say is that if you if you really care about this and you've tuned into today and you wish your city was better run for your city government uh, it's, there's no substitute for every day. I'm an everyday person. People think I'm some sort of like, you can't talk to me or I have a scheduler. I love it when people call and they say, oh, I, I, I couldn't find your scheduler. I was like, uh, don't have a scheduler. <laughs> like, you just talk to me. But, uh, you know, I'm a regular person and regular people should be the people who lead government. Like, I don't, you don't have to have a political career in mind or an agenda, like just, just do it because you care. And so if you're, if you want to see change in your community, the best place to start is asking what you can do for it. Well, and, and actually this is very timely because JC just asked, this is any tips uh, on running for office? Yeah. A couple high level tips. Number one, always be authentically yourself. Uh, there's that doesn't account for needing to identify what's the right, uh, the tone and the timing and the way to project a message that makes sure people understand what you're saying, but authentically be yourself. Don't be somebody that other people tell you you need to be. If people say, oh, voters here won't like this or that or whatever, you're going to be miserable if you get elected because you're never going to do the things that you really want. 
hate to be a little political, but like the Christian cinemas of the world, we don't need more people like that. We need people who are actually themselves and not some made up version of something other people created. So be yourself. Um, number two, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Most people don't realize the first time I ran for office, I lost. I lost by 100 votes. I didn't have any endorsements. Nobody knew who I was. I went door to door and I came so close that a lot of people asked to meet with me after I lost. And they were like, well, we really liked you and your message and you were really friendly. And I was encouraged to run again and I ran again and then I won. I beat five people in my following election. So, you know, I, I would just say be authentic and be positive. People don't want negative people in government. People want positive people in government. The reason I have more three times as many followers as I have constituents is not because I'm an asshole. It's because I'm out there trying to make a difference and I use positive framing to talk about what I believe in and why I'm doing it. And people want to be, you know, friends with leaders like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Doug uh, points out that there is an organization out there, uh, Run for Something, recruits and supports talented, passionate young people who will advocate for progressive values now and into the next uh, 30 years. Thank you, Doug, for that. And, you know, I wanted to, to kind of get over to, to this series of photos because you made your way up into the great white north of uh, Toronto and, uh, and hung out with the good folks up there. Talk a little bit about that experience. Sure. Uh, so Toronto uh, was kind of um, that you're seeing me with different leaders of their advocacy group on our on our bike ride up there. I actually I had planned to bike and that's one of their council members um, who I, w joined us on the bike ride. I, I had a lot of really great conversations. Um, they need to make Young Street's bike lanes permanent. They need to expand them and protect them as well. But they uh, I was kind of I was on Twitter and I had said, you know, I'm coming to Portland and Houston this year and blah, blah, blah. I was like, what city, you know, what city is missing? And one lady who had like 10 followers and I really related to her because that was how I used to be. She says, I really wish you would come to Toronto. I think Toronto would really benefit from someone like you. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, if a hundred people respond to your tweet with yes, come to Toronto, I'll come to Toronto. And like 300 people responded, yes, come to Toronto. <laughs> so I kept my promise and I went to Toronto and I, there you see me, I, I volunteered with a group of volunteers who delivered uh, food. There was uh, there's a food donation program for people in need and on bikes. And I teamed up with the biking lawyer. There he is right there and some other folks. And we went around the community and uh, stocked uh, local uh, free food centers with uh, food that had been donated. Uh, I got a, you know, a, a, a tour of the city on bikes and I, I led a, a bike ride with some of the great advocates, the cycling mayor and some other folks up there in Toronto and shout out to Robin who loaned me the bike that I got to use up there. And we took people on a very casual ride around the city and it ended with ice cream and I bought people ice cream, which is a, my, my thing is you show up for a ride with me. I buy you ice cream. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And, and you got a chance to meet the, the bicycle mayor up there too. Um, also a former guest here on the podcast, Lanrick Bennett Jr. Yeah, uh, and that was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, hey, a nice shout out here from, uh, from JC, uh, positive framing, why I watch and I am a patron of active towns, always a good reminder. And thank you so much for your support, JC. And, no better time than a commercial of saying, yeah, please do what you can to support uh, the channel. Uh, please make sure you give this uh, video a thumbs up if you enjoyed this conversation. Share it with a friend. And if you're not already a subscriber of the channel, please uh, do so. And yes, uh, I have to give a huge shout out to all my Active Towns ambassadors that are supporting me uh, on Patreon, uh, making donations to the nonprofit Advocates for Healthy Communities. That really helps me do uh, pro bono work with cities uh, and, and, and helps with the, the travel as well. So again, thank you so much to all my Active Towns ambassadors. And thank you all so much for tuning in today. This has been such a, a great time. Uh, I had a blast. John, I hope you had a blast. Oh, I had a, I had a blast. This is this is the last thing I'm doing before I go on holiday until the New Year's. So my I am ending 2022 on Active Towns as my last uh, connection to the community, and so I am going to go outside. I am going to enjoy a lot of sugar cookies and some fresh air. And 2023, I'm going to just tell you right now, I have a lot of fun in store. I am not able to break the news today. I wish I could do that. But in January, I will have some announcements about some fun events coming. And so 2023 will be the year of the bicycle. 
Yes. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been an absolute joy, uh, a great way for me to close out uh, season four of the Active Towns podcast. I will have some uh, bonus material coming out uh, next week, uh, the week after Christmas, and uh, it will be back uh, with season five in January. And again, once again, thank you so very much, uh, Mayor John Botters, for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks so much for having me, John, and to all the uh, supporters and fans and followers of Active Towns. I wish you all a very happy holiday and a safe and healthy new year. Fantastic. Okay. Bye, everyone. Have a great holiday weekend. <laughs> Take care. Cheers. <laughs>